We're here today talking to Judge Gertner, and we want to talk to her about her book on in defense of women, memoirs, mem memoirs of an unrepentant advocate. Judge Gertner, it's great to talk to you today, and I want to get right to some things that uh, that you talk about in your book, and also more broadly open it up to some conversations about the role of a woman uh, as an advocate and how you've seen that go over the years. But let's talk about the book. Let's talk about some of the things in the book. I'd love to talk about the book. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously one of the things that we all here are thinking about is how to be good trial lawyers today. And I want to think about with you what it was like to be a young lawyer and walking your way through this Sachs case. Tell us a little bit about that, the Sachs case, the facts of the Sachs okay. case itself. Well, the, the, it was um, uh, a robbery, an armed robbery of a bank. Three peop five people were involved, uh, two, three men and two women. The men were ex-cons, uh, part of a special program at Brandeis for ex-cons. The two women were Brandeis seniors, Brandeis University seniors. And the rationale of the crime was that they wanted to rob banks uh, to get money for the anti-war movement. And the State Street Bank and Trust Company actually was not the only bank that they were supposed to have robbed. There had been a string of robberies in Philadelphia, Newburyport, and then finally in, in Boston. Um, the idea was that they would, three people would go into the bank, two men and Sachs. Uh, they would rob the bank, and they would then get into a switch car several blocks away where Kathy Power would take them away, and then they'd go back and split, a, uh, split across the country. In front of the bank was a guy named Lefty Gilday. And Lefty was charged with making sure that no one interrupted the robbery. Uh, in a, a tragic set of circumstances, uh, a, a, a truck of some sort interfered with his line of vision. The robbery, in fact, was long over. They were already in the car. They were on their way to wherever they were going. He saw a police officer come up the front of the bank and shot him in the back. And because it was felony murder, all of the participants were now charged with first degree murder. The three men, in fact, faced the death penalty. Massachusetts had a death penalty, which was shortly uh, declared unconstitutional. They were, con they were uh, apprehended and convicted uh, immediately. Two of the men were uh, convicted immediately. One was awaiting trial. The two women went underground. Uh, and we, I mean, I didn't know them. I didn't know anything about this. I was in law school. I was probably on the New Haven Green at the same time <laughs> as Susan was. She was demonstrating I was a legal observer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the women, the women uh, uh, went underground. The FBI put them on the 10 most wanted list, but had no idea how to get a woman uh, apprehended. They kept on looking for the women at strip joints and, you know, in Las Vegas, which was ridiculous. It now seems so funny. If they had only looked at daycare centers and natural food stores, they would have come up with <laughs> Susan and Kathy. Oh, yeah. Wow. So there now, was... How did you know Susan? I didn't know her at all. Um, I was, uh, uh, you know, I was a lawyer for all of uh, perhaps three years when she was apprehended. She, uh, you know, wanted to be, she was an enormously principled woman. Mm -hmm. And she wanted her trial to reflect the principles. Mm -hmm. So she wanted a woman lawyer. The mm -hmm. woman lawyer that she initially chose was a woman named Katie Rohrbach from Connecticut, uh, who was an older woman lawyer, phenomenal woman lawyer, mentor of mine, who tried the case in Philadelphia, that robbery, and then didn't want to continue to do an out-of-town case. She was based in New Haven. She didn't want to do an out-of-town case. I was it. Susan wanted a woman lawyer. Uh, you know, I want to say that this was a very complex selection process, but in fact, I was it. The, this, this, the question is why I took the case, right. which was another issue. Right. Now, well, let's talk about that, <laughs> because I know, I know you say in the book that one of the things that you seem to, to recognize is how close she was, in some ways, to you in her education and her experience. Right. I, I mean, there, was a, there were natural things that drove me to want to take the case. Uh, I, uh, you know, I had been active in the anti-war movement and had obviously not gone in the direction that she had gone, but I knew many people who did. Mm -hmm. And I understood the frustrations that had led the movement in that direction. And then in addition, the notion that one could have a life-ending mistake was frightening to me. 
uh, that you could you could have this, you know, the, the whole string of crimes was perhaps a four or five month period of her life, and that for that you wind up essentially losing your life. Um, it was horrifying to me. She her background was somewhat similar to mine. Her parents had more money than than my parents mm -hmm. did, but. Uh, you know, she, it was a middle-class Jewish background, very protective parents. Okay. Um, mine was a lower middle-class background, also protective parents. Mm -hmm. um, and I identified with her, and I bonded with her. I didn't know how to turn the case down. I write in the book that it was more, mm -hmm. more, not so much sort of saying, oh, I'm perfectly fine to take this case. I didn't know how to turn it down, because to turn it down would have been to acknowledge my fears. And they were mighty at the time. Uh -huh. And I didn't want to acknowledge my fears. Uh, now, of course, there was a more rational way of turning the case down, which is, oh, Nancy, you didn't know what you were doing. But that really didn't <laughs> enter into this. I somehow thought that I would be able to learn in time. Uh -huh. In any event, the case was hopeless by everyone's account. Uh -huh. And so the notion was that I, whatever I did was going to be more than what uh -huh. she was going to otherwise Get. So that's how, that's why I took it. Yeah, interesting. Now, when you talk about your relationship with your parents, I hear that as a story that's going on through the numbers of stories you tell as a trial lawyer. And, right, we all talk about whether we're, we're living up to our, making our parents proud of us. And, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll talk about when you get on the bench and, and how, unfortunately, they were not, they didn't survive to see you reach that. But what do you think? Do you think that you're, Mom and Dad were proud of you as they learned about your work over the years? I, I think they, they took some time to get used to it. <laughs> you know, I mean, the model was, um, I mean, my father would say things to me like, I wanted to go to Radcliffe. I didn't want to go to Barnard. I wanted uh -huh. to go out of town. And he would say things to me like, you know, a young woman should either be living with her father or her husband. I mean, the distance between the things he was saying to me and what we were going through was just enormous. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I had a struggle with them, and they had a struggle with, with me. I, I tell a story in the book about coming home for vacation one day after my law review note was published. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother says, oh, come next door. You know, Martha has a new grandchild. And she took me by the hand and took the reprints by the other and went next door. Martha showed us the, baby, the, you know, the new baby, and my mother showed her the reprint. <laughs> now, I... You know, I, it was a wonderful thing that she was trying to do. Uh -huh. I couldn't believe she was finding this equivalent. <laughs> you know, so she was, she was having a lot of trouble figuring out yeah. who I was. Um, and, the, I mean, the saddest part of the book is that by the time, of course, I had children, uh -huh. um, she would have completely understood the life that I, yeah. you know, making brisket at 2 in the morning was mm. something she would have understood, mm. 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 you know. Let's talk about that, back to that case, because there are, We've got young trial lawyers over our shoulder here in, in, in training, and it's interesting. They're working on a felony murder case Oh, themselves. is that right? Okay. And they have been uh, using this felony murder case, this simulation, to try to figure out how it goes. So in the, in the jury selection, one of the things that you talk about is the use of a jury questionnaire. Talk about that. What did you do with that? And how well, did you use that? Well, first, because I knew nothing. I consulted social psychologists. Look at the way we select juries and look at what you, know, what you do for meaningful questionnaires, survey research. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in Massachusetts, there was no jury selection. Mm -hmm. The judge would ask three questions of the juror, of the juror panel uh, uh, as a whole. Are you sensible of any bias and prejudice? I mean, it was written, the question was asked in terms of the statutory language, and it wasn't even English. Are you sensible of any bias? Do you know at the parties, you know, have you read anything about the case? And that was it. The jury questionnaire was recommended to us. And we were able, it was very interesting, because we knew we were carving out new areas, we had to justify it, and justify it mightily. So there had been a survey in Boston. We had gotten survey research of attitudes to Susan Sachs. And the attitudes were extraordinary because something like 75% of the people believed that she was probably guilty. And then the stunning statistic was 90% of that 75 believed they could be fair jurors. So it was clear that the question, are you fair, was not going to get an accurate response. That enormous number of people believed that they could be fair all the while they believed that she was guilty. So we used that to get 
to have uh, the judge to, to, say, you know, I recognize that we, you need to go ahead and ask some more questions right, here. Right, right. Now, you tell us this one little snippet as an example of a woman who said that she, she read that, what is it, that nice article? Lovely article. Lovely article, right? Talk this, about uh, that. Th uh, this is actually a Supreme Court case called hmm. Moo Min is the defendant's name. And, um, I am in the appendix to that. Um, it was about, uh, you know, there, every reason to believe that the normal questioning was not going to get out this kind of, uh, uh, get out this kind of, of prejudice. We asked for lawyer voir dire, which in the South people don't understand. The North does not, for the most part, have lawyer voir dire, except for New York and Connecticut. We asked for lawyer voir dire and individual voir dire, because questioning jurors in the box by the judge. When you think about it, you never do survey research for soaps like this. You know, you know that when you ask jurors and when you ask people as a whole, and you ask in a way in which the only response is yes, you know what the right response is. You're not going to get truth. So we showed this to the judge, and um, and but he was determined to ask the questions. He did individual questions. Well, there had been a terrible article about the case the week before. And it was a terrible article because there was a drawing that had Susan Sachs shooting the cop, which was demonstrably wrong. That wasn't even the government's theory of the case. Um, and it, I mean, it was horrible. So uh, when this juror got up and was asked what she read or saw or heard about the Sachs case, she said, well, I read that lovely article in the Globe. Mm -hmm. And the judge said, well, do you think you can be fair? And she said, yes. And then the judge was about to say she was a fair juror and subject to peremptory challenges. I begged him. That was part of the dynamic here as I was, I was constantly popping up and asking him to do things that were the opposite of what he had been doing for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I begged him to let me question her. Mm -hmm. And we later learned, I mean, he let me question her figuring I would fall on my face. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how to do voir dire. None. All I knew is I looked 12, <laughs> uh, I had a high-pitched voice, and I wouldn't intimidate her. Mm -hmm. So I begged him to let me question her, and I went up to her and I said, um, you said there was a lovely article, can you tell me more about it? She looked at me and she says, we all know she's guilty. It was one question, and it, it, it it wasn't even a, an example of my phenomenal questioning. It was, I wasn't intimidating. I asked in a way that suggested I really wanted to know the answer. Mm -hmm. There was no social distance between mm -hmm. her and me in the way there was with the, with the judge. And I got out a different answer. Of course, the judge never let me question jurors again. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> right. That was the end of that. That had obviously worked, and therefore, no more juror questioning. Oh my yes. Do you remember how many jurors you went through in that case? It was case? like 800. Yeah, and I, and I understand that the judge agreed after you showed the questionnaire to up the peremptories that you had? Yes, the questionnaire that you're talking about is yeah. we did a, it was a survey. survey. It wasn't right. a juror questionnaire right. in the right. usual sense of the term. Th this, was the que this was the survey uh -huh. that showed public attitudes, uh -huh. which was also unusual for the time. You, uh -huh. Usually people would say, oh, the pretrial publicity is horrible, but I didn't trust general arguments would ever work with this judge at that time. And so everything we did had to have data behind it. Right. And, that, and the data was 90%, 75% thought she was probably guilty, and of that, 90% believed they could be fair. That made it clear that the usual techniques of jury selection was not, were not going to be sufficient. And that, and that made all the difference in the world. We had a phenomenal jury. Did that experience affect how you, as a judge, did jury selection? Funny you should ask. <laughs> um, I, I, I have been beating the drum for the past 17 years mm -hmm. about jury selection, mm -hmm. both in terms of the venire. Mm -hmm. Federal courts tend to be white juries. Mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, all, not, not in every city. New York isn't like that. Right. Boston federal juries took from eastern Massachusetts. Mm -hmm which meant that the, the diversity of, the, of Boston, the city, was overwhelmed by the suburbs. And I think that that's a pattern across the country. Mm -hmm. So I was very concerned about who was in the venire. Um, and as a judge, in fact, I had a death penalty case, the only one I ever had. 
uh, where it was clear that the poorer neighborhoods couldn't keep the lists up accurately and the wealthier neighborhoods could. So if the same number of summonses were spread across the area, the wealthier neighborhoods would have accurate lists and people would show up. In the poorer neighborhoods, there would be constant numbers of undeliverables. And so that meant that while it felt like we were being fair, oh, we were trying to get people of color, in, in truth, we were not, because the, the records were, were not accurate. I tried to change that, got reversed by the Court of Appeals, and then we implemented a new rule, which ameliorated that to some degree. But I gave lawyer voir dire mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. I gave individual voir dire mm -hmm. because I, in all my cases, in fact, in all the higher profile mm -hmm. cases, the difference between questioning a jury one-on-one -on -one and not was obvious, mm -hmm. really obvious. I can't, um, it's very difficult to prove to other judges who had not been trial lawyers mm -hmm. that just because you get a verdict doesn't mean that it's a fair verdict. Mm -hmm. Any 12 will do to deliver a verdict, mm -hmm. but the question is whether that's a fair mm -hmm. verdict, and that was a different question. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about the strategy choices. Now, I think you're overly hard on yourself when you say during the trial, we had no theory. I mean, obviously, you had some restrictions on theory choice that the client put on you, right. so I, I hear that. And then I also know, obviously, one of the arguments is it wasn't her. It might have been a girlfriend, right? right? And that right. evolved as right. things went along, a girlfriend of another one of the, of the perpetrators. And then, even if she was there, she was horrified about the, right? It's right. the even if right. argument right. and the theory that's in there. And it strikes me that for trial lawyers, they're always they're trying to figure out if they can get one theory, if there's one consistent theory. And the danger of an inconsistent theory is potentially that you admit then something that's inconsistent, right? right. right? In order I to didn't be able do to it, make but if argument. I did, I was but crazy. Even if I did, I was crazy. Right. That's that a hard one. It is hard. I wondered if uh, how you wrestled with that as you were going through that case, and if you, if you, uh, if you had your choice, obviously you'd try to have one. Mm -hmm. But would you ever argue on the alternative? If, if um, you do, in uh -huh. a, as in, as indirectly as you can. Uh -huh. So um, it, you know, it's really interesting. That my my essentially my first case had so many of the issues that yeah. then are in every other mm -hmm. case. Um, I mean, one thing you would be doing would be cross examining a co-defendant, right. and you would be plumbing the depths of his testimony. Uh -huh. And so in the case of this guy, Valeri, one of the co-defendants, one of the things you would get out, which the, the, would, the jury would just sort of th hear, was that, you know, oh, he had lots of, it was the standard co cross-examination. One is he was a cooperator, and he had this great deal, and that was the basis for him pointing out Susan rather than his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was mm -hmm. one theory. But then when you sort of just were going over the facts of the case, that's all, and the jury knew you were just going over the facts of the case, you made sure that one fact to bring out was that when they got in the car on the way home and they heard that a police officer had died, Susan was aghast. Mm -hmm. And that was just, you had, it, was, it was almost like teasing out blocks mm -hmm. and you were going to build them mm -hmm. any way you could in, mm -hmm. in the closing argument. But that was one block. When I say we didn't have a defense, we had a challenge to the government's case. Right. We had lots of things to say, but I, the question was what was going to be the affirmative case that we put right. on. Right. And in truth, um, I, I won a lot of cases that were uh -huh. reasonable doubt cases, uh -huh. even though people don't th think those are the harder ones. Uh -huh. Um, but even so, there's some discomfort mm -hmm. in not putting on an affirmative case. Yeah. It's, even, it's more than discomfort that comes from not putting on a defendant. That's already a degree of discomfort, because then you're trusting the jury to hear the self-incrimination instruction. Right. Um, but this was, we had no affirmative case. We were we just, you know, we had knocked down the government's case pretty well, uh -huh. but we had no affirmative case. Yeah. And one part of that knockdown was a pushback on attorney-client privilege. Oh. Talk about that. What was that about? Well, that, you know, that, 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 again, it comes from having not known anything. It's one of the advantages that young lawyers actually have, which is you take the usual sort of shibboleths of trial practice, you look at them, and you say, hey, this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So in the trial of the three men, 
one of the sort of peripheral players named Fleischer had testified, and he had testified very powerfully because he could say, I didn't have a deal. And the government said he didn't have a deal. He had been in the House, he had clearly been an accessory before and probably after, and there were no charges brought against him. It was unimaginable that he had no deal. So I researched, and sure enough, there were cases that say that if, you, if the government makes a deal with the lawyer, his lawyer, the defense lawyer, and says, well, you don't have to, don't tell your client the details, but tell him everything's going to be okay. <laughs> that you don't have to disclose that, because after all, it didn't bear on his uh, testimony. It's not like he said, oh, you're going to get two years or one year. And I allege that that had happened here. It was the only explanation. And it wasn't covered by the privilege because it was the prosecutor telling the lawyer um, what to tell the, it was, it was not in something, it, it was not privileged communication to begin with. It was prosecutor, lawyer. And it was a deal and a communication in violation of the Constitution, and it was a deal which should be disclosed. Mm -hmm. And it had the benefits of the usual deal because the testifier knew everything had been taken care of. So we called the lawyer on the stand. Actually, that was the only witness we had. Mm -hmm. And he finally disclosed that he had had an arrangement with the prosecutor. And that arrangement was that Fleischer would not be charged. And so Fleischer was testifying, knowing that he would not be charged. But it was, it, I mean, it was, uh, it was fun to see legal research, yeah. right? I mean, I just, I didn't believe it. I just hit the books. And it was, it, it was sort of something that I had done, which the lawyers who had represented the men didn't think of doing precisely because they were used to doing things in the way they had always done mm -hmm. them. So it, 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 it made me feel the power of my newness in a way. Mm -hmm. so. and, and intuition that this is not right. right. There's got to be something couldn't be here that couldn't, that couldn't be, right. be there. Right. And, and to push through and to, and to figure that out. Right. And right. to realize almost that the prosecutors were in cahoots on how this all gets done, right? Right. With the, with the guys of the And I imagine things, privilege. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a classic practice actually in that office. You uh -huh. set up a deal. Uh -huh not privileged because uh -huh. it's between a, the, the communication between a prosecutor and the defense lawyer, um, but it had the same effect. Yeah. Now talk about what it must have been like. I, you told us last night a little bit about the three letters and the, the two letters or two letters and the gamble that you were really running there at the end to see whether they were going to put them I on. didn't put it in these terms, but it was a Hail Mary pass right. is the way we've come right. to see right. it. Yes. And I, I'm fascinated by the pride. I can see myself doing the same thing the prosecutor did. He was overly confident about the case. He had made broad pronouncements that he was going to rest. This is a piece of cake. He couldn't lose this case kind of thing, right? Right. So in some ways, when you announced that you were resting, when they hadn't put that key evidence on, uh, you were betting that his pride were going to make him not say, well, we need to we reopen. We need to reopen, right? yeah. That's right? all he had to do. That's, so that, to me, that's such a human factor there I was, I mean, to go ahead and close. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I can't say I was betting on it. Uh -huh. I, it, was, it was part of the toolkit. Yeah. If you, it was like a decision tree. If, yeah. he, if we do this, he could do this or he could do that. Right. But boy, that it was, but he was stunned. He was completely stunned. And then, so... But that was actually, that's a very difficult thing for a young lawyer to do. Oh, I'll bet. It, it, it seemed to me that one of the most difficult things for a young lawyer to do, for me to do, was yeah. to know when to stop. Uh-huh. To know when to sit down. Uh -huh. To know when not to ask the next question when uh -huh. you've gotten things fine. And that, that took, I mean, that case was the object lesson. It, you really want to ask the, are you sure? Question, right. oh, <laughs> you know? And, uh -huh. and to know... When to sit down was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So what was that like then? You're sitting at the council table. He says he needs a few minutes to get himself together. You're sitting there. What was that like? What do you remember? How, how did you feel when now you had to go and turn and address the jury in defense of, of uh, Ms. Sachs for her life? What was that like? Um, after uh, two years of preparation for this case, mm -hmm. And then after 
the trial had gone in this amazing way. I was remarkably calm at the time of the jury selection, at, at the time of the, uh, the, the uh, closing argument, and I had practiced. Um, I used to, it used to be clear to me, the way I used to love to talk about jury, about uh, trial preparation was, it really was like learning a language. Mm -hmm. You knew you were prepared when you began to speak idiomatically, mm -hmm. when you were no longer translating from French to English in your brain. Mm -hmm. But you could sort of now take a breath and just talk. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt enormously confident. I, can't, I felt enormously confident that it would go well. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I felt enormously confident that there wouldn't be a conviction mm -hmm. because we had absolutely no idea. But I felt, we, I felt on top of the situation. Mm -hmm. In addition, we had picked a jury. One of the advantages of picking the jury the way we did is I knew this jury. Yeah. We had done investigations of the individual jurors, not investigations that enabled you to talk to them, obviously, but um, I knew who they were. And I crafted a closing argument that enabled me to literally address them individually. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, uh, from having begun my career, graduating Yale Law School, knowing how to talk Yale, mm -hmm. it was a great feeling to be able to talk English to jurors um, and to think about how to translate this. So I, I was, uh, you know, I was high. I, I didn't know where it was going to go, uh -huh. but I was really feeling uh -huh. very high. Now you mentioned that you were a scripter. You, you scripted out everything at least uh, initially on, and that you also, I love this image of you practiced out loud. The shower. You like to, you like to say it out loud right. as a way of practicing. Right. Uh, did you find yourself doing that through your trial at career? Did you continue to do oh, that? Oh, yeah. Is to say it out loud. Oh, yeah. I mean, but it's, it's on the one hand scripting uh -huh. so that you think through everything. Uh -huh. Then it's take, putting away the script because uh -huh. the last thing of the world is to pay attention to the script. Um, and, and then and then I was an actress. Mm -hmm. So you would, I would practice in the shower until my hands began to get wrinkly. Mm. You know, mm. I still do that. In fact, there's a closing argument in a murder case that I lost mm. before I became a judge. Mm. I still do that one over in the shower a lot. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it doesn't stop, mm -hmm. you know. You talked even about paying attention to the pitch of your voice. You, I think you were kidding us last night about sounding like Minnie, Minnie Mouse. Mouse, right. Yeah. Well, it, it was actually one measure of mm -hmm. my otherness in the court. Mm -hmm. You know, when the, when the proceeding would begin and the judge would say, who's here representing who, who, and I would speak, everyone would turn around. I mean, it, the, the courtroom wasn't used to anyone with a pitch like mine. Plus, I sounded very, very young. And plus, one of the things I say to young women lawyers is, at the time, the only models of effective lawyering mm -hmm were male. You know, the Patty Hearst case was going on at the same time as the Susan Sachs case. Mm -hmm. And the newspapers would report, objection, Bailey, F. Lee Bailey boomed. Well, I didn't boom. <laughs> I was just not a booming type. And I had to figure out a way to make this package of what I looked like, how old I was, let the pitch of my voice be effective. So I was acutely aware of, of uh, of all of that, mm -hmm. and I think I had to be. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing a conversation of a trial lawyer, to me as a young lawyer, where well, you gotta start drinking scotch, <laughs> right, in order to be able to yeah. affect it, but it sounds like I would have been on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't my, uh -huh. my forte. And so as you, as you now start to think back on your progression as a trial lawyer, obviously this is quite an amazing learning experience, this first one. Uh, what best practices can you tell us about that you developed in putting a case together, how you would put a case together? Well, the first thing was the advantage of having the Sachs case, which is not something that lawyers now have, is that for, you saw a case from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So now you see young lawyers who believe that the case is about discovery. Mm -hmm. They don't envision any stage beyond drafting a complaint, discovery, and settling the case. Mm -hmm. I saw it from beginning to end. And what that meant is as soon as the client came into your office, you were considering this closing argument. Mm -hmm. As soon as the client came in, you were envisioning what the narrative would be. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one thing. And then the other thing was 
looking for more, looking for, um, you know, not being content mm -hmm. with the facts that have mm -hmm. been presented, digging for mm -hmm. more. Um, and so the story of coming up with something unusual mm -hmm. really goes throughout the mm -hmm. case. Then there was also the question of trying to understand where the jury was. Mm -hmm. Um, not in the abstract, but mm -hmm. this particular understanding the jury in the context of the time. Mm -hmm. So, in uh, one of the last cases, I represented a black man accused of killing a white yeah. woman, and the evidence was really not there. Mm -hmm. um, there were gaps in the evidence, mm -hmm. and I wanted to think about how racism might play out to fill in those gaps. Mm -hmm. And so, I came up with a closing argument. Um, of two kinds. One is the closing argument was a child's dot game. This also came from having been a mother at that point. Right. The, the child's dot game where you put, you have a screen, you have a blackboard and you say here's one dot for this, for his palm print. Hmm. Here's a dot for this. Here's a dot. All the other evidence. Hmm. And I say what the government is trying to do is you step back from that picture and you say, oh yes, I see the outline of the defendant. And I said, I don't see the outline of the defendant. I see the outline of this man. I see the outline of this man. The, 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 the dots are not congealing for the defendant. So then I began to talk about how they shouldn't take the gaps and, and supply the gaps with racism. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we do. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what racism is. You mm -hmm. generalize mm -hmm. from your, either your, your general attitudes to somebody and you mm -hmm. say, oh, someone in his situation must be like X. And that set of attitudes rationalized the dots, mm -hmm. you know, made a, made a pattern that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to explain that to the jury in the hopes of immunizing them so when they got into the jury room and the discussion proceeded like that, my words would be in their mm -hmm. brain. So I mean, it was, it was understanding the attitudes that would be swirling around the jury and dealing with it. Sometimes mm -hmm. I even talked about being a woman lawyer, mm -hmm. you know. I mm -hmm. hope you don't, you know, hold anything against me, because not because I was, I mean, I wanted to make sure I was dealing with their attitudes, uh -huh. um, working on the case as a closing argument from the beginning, and working my heart out. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The only way I could calm myself down before I walked into a courtroom was to do what I had done in the Sachs case, which is to know that I knew everything about that case. And talk about the role that the, we talked about a trial notebook. Talk yeah. about, about your use of trial notebooks. Well, I, it sounds so ridiculous today in a time of computers, but you know, that you'd have a notebook that would be very skinny to begin with. And it would include, you know, the charges, the discovery, and then I would begin to have witness dividers. And every fact that I heard at any time in the case, I'd begin to put in those dividers. And by the time you got to trial, everything that you could imagine about the case, every legal issue you thought abstractly might be an issue, there'd be a legal file, and oh, the, you know, maybe this is going to happen, and maybe this issue would come up. And it would essentially be um, um, a roadmap of everything that could possibly happen in the case. And I would then know that I had prepared well if there really was nothing that came up that wasn't in that book. And I have all these books. It really, it's very, it's really very funny now. I have a big house, which is a good thing. <laughs> so much paper. You talked about a really interesting habit of, of paying attention to the sexism you were experiencing as you were going along, almost having a little notebook of quotes that people- Not almost, sexist se tidbits, sex to file. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I hear in that almost a, a time of reflection about what's happened to you and what happened in the courtroom and in a way what lessons were, were learned from those. Is that, is that fair as to what you were doing? The, the difference between the um, uh, legitimacy that I felt at Yale Law School mm -hmm. and then going into the Boston courts mm -hmm. was so dramatic that it was a learning experience that I was acutely aware of. Uh, the way I describe it in the book, it was like you're in a movie theater and this guy in front of you with a hat. It, at Yale, we'd go, oh, would you mind taking me off the hat? And he'd go, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Take the hat down. When I went, started to go into this crony-ridden, all-male court, racist, probably a little anti-Semitic, um, 
I would say to the guy in front of me, take the hat off, and he'd say no. <laughs> he would just say no. <laughs> and so I was acutely aware of what I was dealing with, and the only way I could deal with it without reacting then mm -hmm. was to write about it. Mm -hmm. And that was enormously helpful. Mm -hmm. that was enor and to strategize about it and to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I talk about, which I think is generalizable today, is you begin to think about how to deal with moments like that. Mm -hmm. And my weapon was humor. Mm -hmm. My weapon was humor. Mm -hmm. To the judge who mm -hmm. sexually harassed mm -hmm. me, to say, you know, uh, uh, you want to chase me around the bench? Actually, I was thinking about the same thing, and of course he was mortified. Um, you know, the, the, you, just to think about what the comeback would be, mm -hmm. which we needed a fair mm -hmm. amount in those days. Did you find yourself preparing uh, almost one-liner responses? I got sometimes? pretty good at it, so uh -huh. I didn't have to think about uh -huh. it. But humor really, the, the other funny thing is, you know, Boston, Boston has, again, it was very crony-ridden, and I had a lawsuit against a, a labor case against St. John of God Hospital. St. <laughs> John of God Hospital had organized, there had been a, a union election, and as soon as the union won, the fathers had determined that the hospital was going to close. And a friend of mine called up and said, you've got to do something. These workers are going to lose their job. Is there a theory? And there really wasn't any labor theory. So I, I came up with a theory that if they closed the hospitals, it, was, it would be malpractice because the only people in the hospital were elderly people. And if you moved them, the chances were they would die. So I, filed, I found uh, the concept of to enjoin a malpractice to enjoin malpractice. So I went into court on a preliminary injunction. Judge looked over at me and, you know, and said to me, Ms. Gertner, how does it feel suing St. John of God? And I said, well, Judge, I take a certain amount of satisfaction out of the fact that it's St. John of God, Inc. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I didn't prepare that in advance. I just knew that I knew what he was saying. And humor was the only way uh -huh to address that. What he was saying is, it was clear, yeah. right? How dare you uh -huh. sue this institution? And I had to figure out a way to say, uh, you know, I'm doing it and I'm doing it for this reason, but doing it in a way that he wasn't going to feel yeah. intimidated. And that notion, I, I remember sometimes when you prepare a witness and you're afraid they're going to get emotionally involved and you're trying, did you have a way of almost teaching uh, your clients how to do what you're talking about, which is to try to not take it personally, try to see the strategy behind it, and then and to try to keep an even keel? Would that be? Well, you had to, I mean, you, it was part of the concept of immunizing them, yes. which is that you, they tell a story they wanted to tell, and then you would have to immunize them out of, from, to deal with what the government uh -huh. was going to throw, or what the, the defendant was, um, was going to throw at yeah. them. Yeah, no, it was, they had to be as prepared as we yeah. had to be. But I also had a criminal defense lawyer sense that uh, in a criminal case, you put your client on rarely, right, if right, at all. Right, so, because you, so it, to try to prepare for even that level yeah, is not... Yeah, well, not, not usual. A civil case uh -huh. is different, but uh -huh. in a criminal case, you really you understood that no matter what else you did in the case, that moment became more important than any other. Mm -hmm and he could win or lose the case. And in fact, see, I saw many cases in which a defendant lost the case. Um, it sounds like you are blessed with a very quick ability to respond and, and a sense of humor that is real. Do you find that you are, did you have a, a mentor? You talk about mentors and, and discussions with other people to help you deal with and understand what it is that's going on. Talk about that. Talk about the discussions and trying to have the the uh, um, issues honestly put out there as opposed to feeling like, actually, it must be true. I'm an outsider. I really don't belong here kind of approach to this. You know, it's interesting. I had mentors in the sense of people supporting me. Uh -huh. um, Harvey Silverglade, who uh -huh. was my partner, who said, go for it in the Sachs case, even though as a firm we were going to take a major financial dive. Mm -hmm. Um, I had it supporting me, but he was actually not a trial lawyer, uh -huh. not a jury trial lawyer. So I had people supporting me, but no one who actually was doing what I was uh -huh. doing. 
And then the people who had been trial lawyers, the older trial lawyers, I couldn't follow their lead because I was dealing with a very different set of, you know, uh, di a different presence. I mean, I remember th talking, watching an older lawyer say, cross-examine someone and saying, you know, kid, I've been around for a while and begin a question that way. And I couldn't do that. I had been around for a minute, you know. So I had to, uh, I had mentors in the sense of people supporting me, mm -hmm. but I didn't have mentors in the sense of someone to model myself out mm -hmm. after in court. There were no women lawyers on television. Mm -hmm. There were no women lawyers anywhere. Mm -hmm. And in one sense, the, the, the mm -hmm. habits that I came to in the Sachs case were what I then used mm -hmm. over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the humor was just, uh, if the, if the, if the humor is my father, mm -hmm. my father's mm -hmm. humor, as, mm -hmm. as in the, mm -hmm. you know, the Sachs case when I took the Sachs case and he told me he wanted me to win and have her walk across the street and be hit by a car. <laughs> so I, the humor was uh -huh. that more uh -huh. than anything else. Uh -huh. And then I, I say to young, to young women, it's also um, humor is a way of leveling the playing fields. Uh -huh. Because if I can get you to laugh uh -huh. um, at something you're doing or at something we're sharing, we're, we're more equal mm -hmm. than we were a moment ago, mm -hmm. as opposed to you cracking a joke at my expense. Mm -hmm. So humor was really, humor and the work equalized the playing field. Uh -huh. You know, there's you a lot of... You could outwork people. I could outwork anybody. You could out-prepare them. You, you know. Right. I could outwork anybody. You know, you just... Yeah. Let me do, no, I mean, we talk a lot about sleep these days. <laughs> how much sleep you need. How, and you mentioned I wasn't sleeping much right. during this part of my life. Right. Right? As a trial lawyer. Right. I mean, how did you develop a rhythm to be able to maintain your sanity through this all? Um, you know, I, uh, w there are a couple of restaurants in Boston that would serve dinner at three in the morning, and that was always helpful. Uh -huh. um, I, I like to describe, it was very funny, sort of this nice Jewish girl from Flushing, Queens, having dinner in the, you know, Moon Villa restaurant with the cops and the hookers. Uh, you know, you got hungry, so you went. Um, uh, I, uh, I just, adrenaline would carry me. Mm -hmm. I was always a night person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you just, adrenaline would carry you. And I think part of the reason I wore red hmm. is because it would then be, you wouldn't look quite as dead in the morning. Hmm. You know, you wore gray and people would know immediately you'd been up all night. You wore red and there was at least some ambiguity, you know, but. Say uh, more about that. So you, you wore <laughs> red, you, oh, I, I read in the book that you started out with many skirts and long hair yep. and you were really a flower child in, yep. your, in your approach. And that Susan was in some ways encouraging a woman's approach to the whole, trial process, but then you evolved. and Talk about that some. Well, uh, you know, um, over time, what had been a liability uh -huh. turned into an advantage. Uh -huh. So my being the first woman in the courtroom uh -huh. ultimately turned into an advantage because um, what happened was that people would want, the, the jurors want to hear my voice. And I, I uh, the, the wearing red was more because I, one of the innovations of the women's movement we thought we were doing is that we were, we were going we to deal with these roles, but we're going to deal with these roles on our terms. Uh -huh. And that meant I was going to wear a suit. I had to wear a suit. And the, uh -huh. the skirts had to get a little lower. It was a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to wear red. Uh -huh. I was going to wear bright colors. Uh -huh. um, if F. Lee Bailey was going to control the courtroom with his voice and his stature, I was going to control it by being, you know, wearing red. Um, and I love to tell the story. I particularly loved it when I was pregnant. Right. After all the years of, uh, you know, feeling invisible in the court at the beginning, this was a moment when I come waddling into court. I, I love to tell the story of uh, Clarence Darrow. He had a, had a cigar you, in a time when you could smoke in court, and he had a, he had a, um, a metal uh, uh, stick that he would put in the cigar. So as he smoked, the ash would get longer and longer. The jury would then watch the ash. Um, so I was going to do the same thing with my belly. During the closing argument of the uh, other lawyer, I put my hands on my belly and I moaned softly. <laughs> there was no one who paid any attention to him. And it was, I thought it was payback. You know, it was just payback. So no, it was carving out who uh -huh. I was. And what I was was different from, uh -huh. from men. Uh -huh. And um, I, my latest... 
uh, her latest crusade is to try to keep women from being told to wear black suits and mm -hmm. white shirts and closed toed shoes and mm -hmm. wear a uniform. There's no uniform. You want to be a woman in the courtroom, be a woman in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. All the relevant body parts ought to be covered, however, mm -hmm. I have to admit, that is important. Mm -hmm. but, um, but beyond that, there shouldn't be an orthodoxy. Have you been back to the courtroom since you've been off the bench again? <laughs> I, um, I've been involved in cases now. I actually entered an appearance in a case. Um, I haven't actually been in court. I may have lost the gene for groveling. Hmm. So I'm not sure I can do this again. Hmm. It would, uh, I'm not sure that if I, knowing what I know, could could take the kinds of things that trial lawyers have to take. I, I just, I just mm -hmm. am not sure. That, was, that would be hard. Mm -hmm. That would be hard. Because I really do. I, it's almost as if I can look at the judge, look at the papers on his desk, and get an immediate sense of whether he really has read anything, mm -hmm. whether he knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I need to do with that information. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I also... Um, you don't know how to do trial work except 100%. Mm -hmm. so it's not clear to me that, I'm, that I want to do it 100% mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. I also no longer can stay up all night and look good in the morning. <laughs> this has to be said. I look like terrible in the morning when I haven't slept. Pretty so nice. I'm not sure I can, my vanity will allow me well, to do this. Good, That's right. I can function. There's no yeah. question about it. You know, the adrenaline comes in, but oh my God. Yeah. You just look like death warmed over. As you see what you went through, and now you see women lawyers in the, in the courtroom in front of you when you were on the bench, how have things changed? Well, um, troublingly, Boston, there were actually very few women mm -hmm. trial lawyers. I don't know whether Boston's a small city. New York mm -hmm. is different. The women were mostly public defenders or U.S. attorneys. In the big firms, there were very few women litigators. And um, I was very, very troubled by that. It's one of the mm -hmm. things I began to, to speak about. Mm -hmm. They were in the, you know, the second or third row. I would say things. I, my favorite example was a patent case where there were uh, was lawyers, all male lawyers in the front rows, and then a woman in the first row of, of the audience. One of the male partners, who I knew had not had any role in preparing the case, but he was the senior partner, so he was you know, pretending that he knew what he was talking about. Uh, there was a young man who was arguing. And every once in a while, when the senior partner wanted to tell the young man what he should argue, he would go like this. And he would wave to the woman sitting in back of him to come forward, get his note, and deliver it to the man who was a few inches in front. I watched that a couple of times, and I decided that I had to say something. So at a break, no jury was present, I said, Mr. Smith, I'm going to rearrange the furniture in the courtroom so you won't have to walk far and she won't have to do your bidding. Will that be okay? <coughs> so I made the point. Mm -hmm. But that was, a tr that was troubling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was troubling. This raises a whole series of <coughs> topics that I'd love to talk to you about. We, we we're not going to have the time to explore them fully, but obviously you spent some time representing women in discrimination cases. That's uh, how your practice evolved. And I'd like you to tell us about what you think about the law uh, and the, the way the law is being applied in these discrimination cases. Uh, that's the next book. Yeah. Um, I, I think in some discrimination cases it felt like a kabuki ritual, which is we were going through the motions. It sounded like we were talking about rights. It sounded like we were talking about rules, but in fact there was no substance. And in the, on the discrimination side in particular, the law has evolved so that complex human phenomena is treated, a complex human phenomenon is treated like, uh, you know, essentially sliced and diced in a way that doesn't make any sense. Where we will, you know, my, my, favorite, my, my favorite example is the concept of stray remarks in discrimination law. Someone will say, when he called her a bitch, it was a stray remark. And the implication was you take that remark and you take it out of the pot of evidence. Now, the notion that what we say doesn't reflect our soul, doesn't reflect who we are and therefore shouldn't be considered, is preposterous. 
But sure enough, out of a line in an O'Connor uh, concurrence, there was this concept of stray remarks. And court after court was now using this to, uh, to, to, to throw out discrimination cases. It was as if no one has stepped back and said, you know, this makes no sense. Or this, you know, statute of limitations concept makes no sense. Um, I, I was very disturbed, and it's one of the things I want to, I want to write about. We've, um, it's as if the, the 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 thrust of the cases is to get rid of them, mm -hmm. as opposed to, to not. One of the things I'm writing is a mm -hmm. piece called "Losers' Rules," which mm -hmm. is going to come out in a month or so about how um, in the discrimination area, if you dismiss the case, you have to write a decision. But if you let the case go on to a trial, you don't. So the only decisions that are being written are in the losing cases. And what happens then is the judges begin to see these cases as frivolous. And over and over again, they are, you know, it's just, it's just seen as frivolous. And that is the way you begin to, you know, characterize the field. So no, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very troubled. I mean, right. I've seen cases. Um, uh, I didn't do this. I would write when I was uh, denying a motion to dismiss, or, mm -hmm. or I would write an opinion when I was denying mm -hmm. a motion for mm -hmm. summary judgment, even though there, you know, there was no appeal from it. Mm -hmm. and, but I wanted to say this is the template of what a bona fide case looks like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So something has to be done mm -hmm. about that, because to all intents and purposes, large numbers of discrimination cases fail at the summary judgment mm -hmm. stage. And now, after the Iqbal decision, mm -hmm. are failing at the complaint stage. Mm -hmm. And when you think of what we're doing, particularly with Iqbal, mm -hmm. a largely male, middle-class, white federal bench is determining which discrimination cases are plausible. Mm -hmm. In my world, what's plausible to me It'd be, be very different than mm -hmm. what's plausible to the judge across the street. Mm -hmm. And the notion that we've now moved to that without examining what our values are and what our norms are is very troubling. Right. But that's the next book. All right. All right. And, you know, there's obviously statistical support. The glass ceiling is alive and well, whether it's in academia, right, or it's in the, in the professions. And so there's statistical support that discrimination is continuing, right. even though we know that there are 50% women in law schools and things like that. And I mean, is it discouraging? Um, or do you see any hope in the, in the evolution here of the process or the role of women themselves in this process? I think it's more complicated because uh -huh. it's no longer a sign on the door that says women need not apply. And uh -huh. it's no longer the, the employer who says to you, you know, I'm sorry, we don't hire women here. It's a much more subtle uh, kind of thing, but um, I'm, I'm an optimist. In, in one sense, you know, law firms and law firm hiring is, the, is a great natural experiment mm -hmm. because we know that since the 80s, 50% of law school classes and 50% of the entering group in law firms are women. So the failure of women to be reflected in the ranks of the higher echelons in the firm um, it, it's certainly not a product of numbers, it's certainly not a product of a pool, qualifications of the pool, has to be something else. And what's the something else? Is the something else something about social attitudes of work and family? Is it implicit bias? Uh, is it men something else is going on? So I'm, in one sense, I'm heartened because I think we can examine and we can identify it. Um, and I have to be an optimist, otherwise I can't function. <laughs> Well, say a little bit, if I can get you at the end here, to talk about, you, you've sued Harvard Law School, right, <laughs> on behalf of, uh, now how do you end up being back on the faculty, and Beats what's me. that like? What's um, that like? Uh, it's a little strange. Uh -huh. um, I sued Harvard on behalf of Claire Dalton mm -hmm. uh, for the denial of tenure. Uh -huh. This was in uh, 1994, just before I went on the bench. Uh -huh. uh, the case was settled. And, you know, 17 years pass. The place is a different place. They have, they're on their second women, woman dean. Uh -huh. um, some of the people who had supported Claire are now in positions of power uh -huh. in the law school. And, um, and you know, it, uh, uh, it, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing because they could separate out the lawyer from the, from the case. 
<laughs> you know, that mm -hmm. I was a lawyer. The mm -hmm. wrong had been done. I was prepared to represent, the, mm -hmm. represent her. And, um, you know, I did it in a way that they thought reflected integrity. So mm -hmm. they could, um, you know, I think there's also a certain amount of fun, I have to admit, in the notion mm -hmm. of hiring me away from Yale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was certainly part of it. <laughs> Um, but it's, um, no, I, the, the, you know, the place has changed, and I think this is a reflection of it. But then again, you know, I became a judge on a court that I had sued, too. Mm -hmm. So this is a theme in my mm -hmm. life. I had represented a woman clerk who had been discriminated against by the District Court of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I did this all my life. Mm -hmm. And the, the takeaway from that, it's fun to talk about, is that um, I, I find law students extraordinarily cautious today. Mm -hmm and afraid to take positions, and afraid to do this, lest it follow them in some way in their future career. There's a way of doing things that, that is civil, that has integrity, that enables the opponent to know, gee, you think passionately about what you're doing, but you're going to play by the rules. So that when I was up for a judge, we got letters from every prosecutor that I had ever opposed. The letters were often of the form, geez, do I disagree with her? But I actually think she could be fair and ethical and have integrity. So I felt comfortable then as now that I could say what I believed in and people would understand that uh, you know it was coming from a matter of a place of principle, mm -hmm. and that's all you need. Mm 